Okay. Um, good try. Very good work. It's uh, Etcho Denny and Denny as well. So I'll begin by saying my name. My name is Caleb Bain. I'm from Northeastern BC. Um, and I acknowledge my presence on Coast Salish territory, the state here as well. And thanks to them for having me and having us here. Um, to the extent that I can on your behalf, I say thanks as well. Um, what I'm talking about uh, is fracking and, um, and some, some information that comes out of that, some, some realities from my territory, and also an idea. Um, uh, I'll begin by kind of describing the process and then talk a little bit about the information I know from where I'm coming from present the idea. Uh, what you see behind me is a schematic of hydraulic fracturing brought from Gasland, which is a movie of the U.S. Some of you might have seen. I'm not sure how many of you know what fracking is. It's a mechanism to unlock gas from um, shale seams. So what happens is you roll in with the truck and pump uh, about a million gallons of water per frack down into shale seams under massive pressure at 10,000 psi and up with uh, propane, sand, and um, various chemicals. What we do in BC, and BC is a world leader in this, the biggest fracks by volume in, in the world are in BC, in northeastern BC. Um, what you do with this is you go in and fracture all this rock, um, you suck back the water, and then the gas flows. Um, and it's, it's massive, and the technology is relatively new. It comes with a Barnett shale in the US. And, um, and when I came out of undergrad, I went home to my people and started working on land and resource issues, and rapidly realized that the vast majority of the land in our territory is being sold. Um, the leases are being sold. And so the province of BC made a couple billion dollars uh, over 2006 to 2009. They're still making money up there. Okay, so this is a map um, from 1899 of the treaty, uh, Treaty 8. Um, my people, uh, the beavers, and the slaves, and not the dog group so much. And that's, those are names, those are constructs that are inappropriate, but I'll use them for description. Gives an idea of where I'm from. So, my mother's people are from a place called West Mobile, the red dot right there. My father's people are from the little red dot up top. Um, those two nations are West Mobile First Nation and Port Nelson First Nation. West Mobile is adjacent to the Montney Play. Um, Port Nelson is adjacent to the Horn River. Those are the two biggest, the Horn River in particular, the two biggest tight gas, shale gas developments um, in BC, and the biggest in Canada at this point. Uh, what you're seeing here are the, and this is a slide, this is a series of slides created in 2006 to illustrate the depth of development in the territory I'm from. Uh, these are patrolling development roads, so these do not show for service roads, these don't show kind of the general access points. This is just stuff from patrolling development. These are uh, facilities. So these would be things like what I call dehydrators, which produce a lot of benzene. Um, these are places where the gas is purified and processed. These are well sites. Um, and these don't include the previous things. Uh, these, are, these are well sites. In 2007 and 2008, the count was about 26,000 wells in my territory. There's between 10 and 15,000 more proposed in the Horn River. Um, and I can't easily describe how tough it is coming from a different tradition. Uh, to see the land that you're from and that has sustained your people um, have this level of development. You know, a third of the power in this room, these lights, comes from my territory. That big lake there, the reservoir, that's Wilson Reservoir. The WC Bennett Dam and the Peace Canyon Dam together produce almost the majority of the power in British Columbia. Um, there's obviously Kootenays in those developments as well. Um, the appreciable quantity of the coal in BC comes from my territory. The first two major wind developments in BC are in my territory, one of which is on my grandfather's uh, track line, the Doki Phase 1 project. Um, a good chunk of the forestry, where I'm from, um, we have given uh, since the fur trade forward um, for BC and for you, um, for you here in the South. And I say that with the utmost respect, but I do indict you. I do indict you in a serious way um, because if you're from the North, I'm not sure how many of you are. We see very, very clearly, and next slide, please. Um, these are seismic lines. Maybe put the next slide up as well. This is the combination. Um, and, and it's not to scale. I mean, you have to go up there to kind of see. It looks really big on this map, but it kind of gives you a sense of the development. And this, again, was before all this land got sold. This is before the next 15, 20,000 miles were proposed. This is a territory that's given a great deal to the province and to you and to me and to my family, but it, a lot has been taken literally and figuratively. This is uh, the first phase of the um, cabin gas plant in the Horn River. It will be the largest gas plant in Canada. Uh, it will produce 2.17 million tons of greenhouse gases at full production. This is phase one, you're seeing. There will be five more phases, and together that will become the largest gas plant. In the distance, you see pipelines, 
seeing petroleum development roads. Um, and you won't see a lot of buildings. You won't see um, the kind of thing you might see in Vancouver. Where I'm from, we're the hinterland. You know, where I'm from, this is politically acceptable. Where I'm from, the dialogue on this kind of development doesn't matter. Um, and I feel in many ways like I don't matter, which is why I attended this institution. And I went to UVic Law, and um, I do a number of other projects on the side, uh, because I saw things like this, and I was raised with things like this. This is a typical well pad being drilled. Uh, so you've got two drill rigs. Um, we took this picture when we were out shooting um, for this movie I'm working on this winter. Uh, and it's tough to describe how difficult it is to go to a place where your grandfather spoke of the old traditions and um, the old values and the old world and see these things. And I don't, I don't again, I, don't, I, I said I would indict you, but I don't indict you for this. This just hurts me, and that's a consequence of where I'm from. That's a consequence of my value system. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm not, I'm not accusing you guys of like buying into this world, or not. Like, it's not for me to say, but it, it hurts me and it compelled me to engage. Um, this was a, uh, a well site gone wrong. Um, a drill rig had a blowout, so a massive push of gas that uh, blew out the blowout preventer, which is the same thing that happened uh, in the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf. They burned 60 million cubic feet of gas uh, this day, and they burned close to that amount for the next 30 days trying to put this thing out. Um, this is after I finished my undergrad, I went, I went home, and, and these kinds of things happening, albeit rarely, but they are happening in my territory. And I don't think if you saw this kind of thing in Vancouver or in Kamloops, people would be so complacent about scale development in the country that I'm from, in the territory I'm from, the territory that sustains my world. And so, what I, and that's the information. The Horn River, Martin Clay, Northeast BC, is the center of fracking in Canada. It's among the biggest in the world, and it's happening now. Christy Clark, two days ago, announced new fracking rules at the annual BC Oil and Gas Symposium in Fort Nelson, which is adjacent to the Horn River. Um, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers announced new uh, fracking regulations and transparency mechanisms uh, the same day, which is a funny coincidence, but so it goes. Um, this is a conference happening in Houston, um, and I want to draw your attention to something that really intrigues me. Uh, they, they talk about how to leverage mass media, social media, and community support. That's a battle that I'm engaged in, in addition to the law. My, my family's going to trial on Monday at the BC Supreme Court over um, some issues on our land. So we're, we're fighting using the law. But um, I recognize fairly early, and thanks to some of the people in the crowd actually, uh, that the law is not the best way to fight with this. I need people like you and events like this um, to engage. And so on the right, you'll see um, kind of a, just a, a rough up image of kind of the media package for this movie we're working on called Fractured Land. Um, myself and some other people in the crowd um, decided that this issue, the, the scale of fracking development, the scale of fracking and unconventional gas development in British Columbia, was a story that wasn't, wasn't told. And we wanted to inform that debate. We wanted to engage that issue. On the left, you'll see an, um, a full-page ad from New Yorker two weeks ago. Um, and that is the, I think it's the American National Gas Association. And I'm not saying these two are necessarily opposed, but it's interesting that they both exist at the same time. I think there's a causal relationship between the two. I think that uh, Josh Fox's movie Gasland, I think the increasing awareness around fracking, I think my presence here, the work that we're doing in that movie, has compelled the industry and government to engage on these issues. And so the idea I'd like to put forward is that um, I think the beginning of what was the question I was asked to kind of speak to. And I thought about and I thought about technology and the role technology has had in my life, my family's life, my people's land. And I realized um, that technology in many ways, like in fracking for example, is emergent technology. It's, it's made unconventional, formerly non-economic resources now economic. And, and that's, that's inevitability. When you deal with non-renewables, which we've all taken apart, and that's part of the indictment, for you to call you out. Um, they will become valuable. That's why there's a big dam. That's why there's another dam proposed in my territory. That's why there's wind development. That's why coal is marketable. That's why so many trees get cut down. Um, and to my mind, from my traditional perspective, that is destructive potential. I'm not saying these practices are inherently destructive, but the way it's gone down in my territory, and that map before with all those different types of impacts, illustrates how um, 
how hard it can be to have an informed debate about resource development. And, and, and that's the scary side of technology, because as a young person, I think many people in the stream might do this, um, it's tough for us to look at the world around us and decide what we might do. But there's a flip side, and that's that technology, um, technology that brings us together, technology that, uh, that, that allows for our ideas and our creativity and our optimism to work together is also engaging with the more destructive side of our tech, at least the destructive potential that we have with technology. I mean, fracking works, and fracking made billions for the government, and fracking is occurring because it's valuable. Um, but at the same time, there is a recognition that there's consequences. And the extent to which I and many others can bring this information to you, I think we can have a debate about it. And I think that what you're seeing in that dynamic is the other side of technology coming forward. And the beginning of what? I think it's the beginning of our social um, awareness and creativity and interconnectedness, being able to engage with our destructive potential. And we live in a world where, as a species, we could destroy this planet. My people saw that coming. Where I'm from, there's a prophecy of a time when the muskeg would burn and holes would just open up in our land. And it, and it didn't make sense, clearly, to the people speaking this. This is back in the 20s and 30s, some of the last prophets in my country. But now, looking at it and seeing a million gallons taken out of rivers and streams, um, or recycled in some cases, to go into fracking. You know, one well, the record right now is 274 fracks in a single pad. So that's theoretically 274 million gallons. You know, a million gallons is like, I think, six Olympic sized swimming pools. It was inconceivable for my ancestors to recognize the time when the muskeg could burn because it was wet. That's a real possibility now. And I'm not saying those prophecies are true or should be taken literally, at least for you. That's a value system I have that I'm not asking you to share. But what I do ask you to consider is the reality that we could seriously mess up this earth. And people in my generation, I think people in all generations now are, are engaging with that. And what we've done um, is tried to use social media, tried to use film to engage. And it's interesting that the natural gas companies are doing the same thing. And, and I was sitting in the crowd and, and thinking about what I might say to you and how I might describe this idea. And, and what I realized is that this is the forefront of the battle. This is a different kind of front in the discussion and dialogue that we might have. And so you and I and our presence here at this TEDx event and all around the world, this is how the new dynamic is going to be shaped. Um, and maybe that kind of comes across poorly, but I think that our space together, this thing, this, this idea for the kind of spread, I think they're, they're being shaped in a way that's beyond the typical. And this is sort of typical media, I think, even as it's progressive, even as it's social. This space, this thing, is how us as a species and as a society is going to understand and inform itself and debate and dialogue on the more destructive side of what we do. And that's, for me and my work, hydraulic fracturing, major, major gas development in BC. And, and it has to be understood that, that you know, while I speak of Northeast BC, um, the gas is probably going to happen sands or Kitimat to go with Asia. These are all interconnected dynamics. And so I guess I'd just like to end with that idea that, you know, thank you to giving me a space to talk about this, but understand that you're a part of this. You might not know where I'm from. You might not know the scale of development where I'm from. You might not know where what happened because the dam made this pattern of light. But you're learning. And, and I think in that space of learning, in that space of dialogue, you form the dialogue. And I think you see things like this in the media, and you see the Premier announcing new rules, and we see the results of that dialogue, which is further discussion and reference. So with that, I'll finish.